Blog Talk Radio. Hello, everyone. Good morning. This is Lord Smith of Blog Talk Radio. It is 6 o'clock here in the morning, um, Wednesday morning, and uh, I believe it's May the 25th. And, uh, yeah, this is One Child Abuse Survivor to Another. One for 30 minutes. It's a live internet streaming radio broadcast from blogtalkradio.com. And the chat room's open there now. I just popped the chat room up. I'll be putting the link in there to what we're talking about. We're looking at two web pages from uh, Robert Burney called Joy to You and Me from healing.about.com. And um, he's written a book, and he's an author. He's written a book called Codependence, The Dance of Wounded Souls. He's a codependent therapist, and he's a spiritual teacher. And there's a lot of good stuff there. And yesterday we were looking at this one section uh, dealing with the issue of grieving, so adult survivors and grieving. So it's quite interesting what he has to say there. So we'll just continue on with that. And I just appreciate everybody who's tuning in and uh, taking the time to listen to my shows. That's just awesome. And, you know, I just appreciate everybody doing that. I know it's a lot to keep up with my shows because I do so many shows. I've actually had to cancel some shows um, just, you know, due to what's been happening in my life and just been so busy. And uh, But um, I should be back in my normal schedule probably in June, I'd say. I hope to be back in the, doing all my shows in June sometime, especially about the middle of June. Because uh, I enjoy doing all the shows, but uh, for now I'm just kind of doing my morning shows, uh, one child to be survivor to another, and some of my weekend shows, which will probably be canceled this weekend because I'm so busy. But uh, June June's looking a lot better, so yeah, I appreciate everybody tuning in. My good friend Gypsy, which is here, hello dear, and um, so, yeah, we'll get right into this. I just popped the link into the chat room, uh, regarding you know this uh, these web pages from Robert Burney, B U R N E Y, and. Um, a lot of the stuff he's written is actually excerpts from his book, pieces from his book, uh, Codependence, the Dance of Wounded Souls, which I'd like to get a hold of one day, so, you know, we'll see. But anyway, some of the stuff he's written I, I, I can identify with, and some of it I can't, but it doesn't matter because it's really good information to take a look at. And I just find, you know, this helpful for me to go through and look at these, uh, you know, the, this information, especially about inner child work and... Um, the pro, the the issues of codependency uh, boundaries and inner child work and stuff like that because I'm still working through a lot of this stuff and so I'm kind of looking to to learn as much as I can and allow myself to work through as much as I can as adults as an adult survivor right so you have to listen to you know my all of my shows at your own discretion because I'm talking about abuse and you know I'm just a private citizen paying to do my shows I'm not a counselor or a therapist or anything like that you know I'm just a I just wanted to be one more voice speaking out against abuse and also uh, one more, another voice for survivors. You know, there's, there's so many of us out here, it's absolutely horrible. And, um, you know, there shouldn't be one of us out here, but there's so many people who have been abused, you know, and I just wanted to be one more voice of um, encouragement for people to keep going and, you know, get, get help where you can find it, whatever works for you. Everybody's different and everybody needs different things. And, and um, you know, I just want to be another voice. So you have to listen at your own discretion to all of my shows because I'm talking about abuse and it's a very sensitive subject. And young people under the age of 18, I just ask that you have permission from an adult. Somebody, if you have, hopefully, somebody who cares about you, like an adult, a parent, caregiver, teacher, coach, or somebody to listen to the show with you and then they can help you make a decision whether you should be listening or not. And uh, I'd appreciate that because I don't know how young the people are who are listening to my shows. And there's a lot of adult content, mature material on my shows. So, And I believe children should be protected at all times. I'm the Canada Regional Director for Dreamcatchers for Abused Children. And we're standing up to, to fight to save children's lives and to protect children. And you have the right to be protected at all times. So if you're under 18, get somebody to listen to the show with you who's older. And they can help you make a decision whether you should be listening or not. So thank you. So we'll get right into this this particular section, Grieving, and uh, it's actually titled, we're about halfway through there now, but I'll get Grief Process Techniques, and this is what Robert Bernie's talking about, and, you know, he says, in order to do the inner child work, we need to be willing to do the grief work, and he says, emotions are energy, and that energy needs to be released through crying and raging, and he says, we need to own our feelings about what happened to us, we need to own our right to be angry that our needs were not met, so many times children's needs are not met in every way, you know. Uh, And then you have to grow up and and deal with this stuff as an adult. It says, grief is energy that needs to be released. And we need to give ourselves permission to feel our pain, sadness, and rage. We need to own and honor the feelings. Part of grief work is simply owning the sadness and the anger. And we need to own the grief of what happened to us as children. And then we also need to own the grief over what effect it has had on us as an adult. So it's quite interesting. It's just really um, taking a, a look at what happened. And I think to do the grieving work, you know, I've done, I was talking about this the other day, Maybe maybe yesterday, you know that I'm that 
um, I did a lot of this grieving work in, in my 30s, even before I had started my healing journey, really, because I wasn't really thinking about my healing journey, but I had just had so much, you know, sort of sad things happen at the, all at the same time, and and uh, I just really needed to grieve. You know, my mother had passed away, and I knew I was never going to ever be able to reconcile my relationship with her, even if she was on the planet. It wouldn't. Uh, it just wasn't going to ever happen. And when she passed away, it was just like this final, you know, this reality, this finalization of like, wow, I'm never ever going to hear from her what I needed to hear from her. There was always some hope in the back of my mind that, you know, when I got older that she would exonerate herself, <laughs> you know what I mean? And tell me that she was, that she did love me and that she did want me and that she that she didn't hate me and, that, you know what I mean, this kind of go back and undo some of the damage that she had done. And she, you know, she, after she passed away, I knew there was no possibility of that. So it was really harsh for my little inner child to have to deal with that. And so, and I, you know, I had lost my baby and, and halfway through the pregnancy, and then I left my boyfriend because I was very, very stressed out. And all this stuff happened within three months. So I mean, I really needed to grieve, and I, I came back to Canada and, and got an apartment. And it, for it took me a year to go through this process of allowing myself to just you know, grieve and cry, and I, I cried for like a year in my apartment, nobody really knew that, and then, because uh, I'd work, you know, I'd go to work, and then I'd come home, and I'd just cry and cry, I didn't know anybody in Calgary, I had no friends, and um, I actually came to a city where I actually had no no support, period, but I was kind of used to that, I, you know, not having that support, so that's so much, that didn't bother me so much, I was actually feeling kind of, actually in a bit of a safe place because I didn't have anybody around and I could actually do the work that I needed to do. But I wasn't even on my healing journey at that point. So that didn't happen for another 10 years, really. So not until the age of 41. So, yeah, it's harsh. And we need to make sure that, you know, if we can't deal with this stuff, that we have to get help, you know what I mean? Because it's, uh, you know, it's really important for people to realize that there there are good people out there and there is help out there. You know, I was always just thinking I have to do all this on my own. And then finally when I started reaching out four years ago is when I started to heal. And so that's the thing. It's very important to get some help where you can, you know, what, what's, what, whatever works for you. We're all different, you know what I mean? So and so we, we left off talking here. He says it's terrifying to face the healing, the he, for, to face healing the emotional wounds, he says. It takes great courage and faith to do the grief work. And the only way to do it is with a spiritual program. Now, this is Robert Bernie talking, right? And he says, recovery is not self-help. We're not doing this work alone. Our spirit is guiding us. And he says, the force is with us. Sounds like something out of Star Wars. But anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I like Star Wars, so there you go. There you go. Um, it says, there's no quick fix. Understanding the process does not replace going through it. There's no magic pill. There's no magic book. There's no guru or channeled entity that can make it possible to avoid the journey within, the journey through feelings, he says. So he says, no no one outside of self, true spiritual self, is going to magically heal us. Well, I kind of, you know, I was talking about that, and I always kind of mentioned that, is that I sort of thought there'd be somebody who'd come along who could make everything right. You know, I, I was wishing for somebody to take all my pain away, you know, like a friend or somebody I would, you know, or even my sweetheart, you know, and, and anybody. I was kind of looking for that, and I thought maybe someday somebody would be able to take all my pain away and actually that's four years ago is when I, when I started my healing journey. That's the realization that came to me was that nobody was going to be able to do that for me and I was going to have to do it myself. And so, and I did that on my own without reading any books or, you know, anything like that. I, I was actually sitting on the couch contemplating suicide and uh, self-injury. I was going to rip myself to shreds with a screwdriver and, um, you know, I wanted to hurt myself so I could show the world how much pain I was in. And then I was thinking, oh, how, how am I going to get out of this pain? <clears throat> you know, this inter internal suffering that was going on. And I thought, man, I'm if I do this and I hurt myself, nobody's going to care. I'm just going to be hurting myself. And after I've survived this abuse and and, and already been wounded enough, and what I'm going to do this to myself, I got mad. And I was like, that's it. That's enough. And I thought, okay, so <clears throat> then I'm going to have to do this myself. So that's where I started my healing journey four years ago. It was to realize that nobody was going to be able to do it for me. I was going to have to do it myself. And from that point on, is when I started my healing journey, and, and a day, little one day at a time. You know what I mean? Like I would just, I would just, you know, focus on on finding information that was helpful, and I would just sit there and I'd do self affirmations, positive affirmations, and really started talking to myself. And you know, it, it did help. Like that was that was actually what had to happen. Otherwise, I was going to continue spiraling, uh, you know, through this depression and through this um, anger, through this rage, and and my life was just going to be a mess, you know, and I thought, 
I'm going to have to change this, you know. So that's exactly what happened to me. It was a realization that nobody was going to be able to do that for me. And he says here, um, psychoanalysis addresses these issues only on an intellectual level, not on the emotional level, a healing level. As a result, a person could go to psychoanalysis weekly for 20 years and still repeating this, be repeating the same behavioral patterns. So I don't know because I didn't go to, haven't done any real therapy, so I don't really know, like, you know, how people, how it works for people and if it was helpful or not, you know what I mean? I've talked to some survivors who said that, you know, therapy was very helpful and then I've talked to other survivors that said that it wasn't. So, you know, I think it depends on the therapist. I think it depends on the, on the patient, you know what I mean? It, it depends on everything. And that's why, you know, I mean, I think if we have to know ourselves where we want to end up in the end of this, you know, we have to have a plan. And I did read that in quite a few different um, websites talking about therapy and stuff like that. And they said, you know, it's very important for the person who's, who, you know, who needs the help to get an idea and a picture of what they're looking for at the end of the road. Are they, you know, if, and how do how do they think they're going to accomplish that? You know, because if we don't realize that we need to change some of our behaviors and then somebody goes and tells, you know, a therapist or counselor that, you know, our, some of our behaviors are out of, out of line and we really need to work work on them, I mean, to help ourselves, Right. But we're not ready to do that, you know, because we're not feeling like it's our, it has anything to do with us. And it's just, you know, we could, I think people could actually um, not do the work because they don't feel that they need to, you know what I mean? And they could actually get stuck in a situation like that. I think that, you know, for me, I had to realize, even though I'm not doing therapy, I'm just doing self-help, um, I realized that a lot of my behaviors were, they were, they were messed up, you know, because the way the way I was brought up, the the, tra- the, the thinking, you know, my thinking patterns, my thought patterns, everything was twisted because my parents were twisted. And so what I started to realize is after after meeting so many normal people throughout my life, which I would consider quite normal, um, you know, what's normal, but I mean, you know, as normal as possible and decent, you know, decent people, kind people. Right? I mean, I started to meet these people that were just good people, you know. And I thought, hey, look at their behaviors. You know, they're not they're not doing this and and they're not doing that, and and they're they seem very uh, genuine and, and peaceful in their lives. And and what are they doing? And I started to sort of try to mimic their behaviors. I've done this all my life, and so I kind of you know I could see that my behaviors, some of them were and thought patterns were very twisted compared to theirs. You know what I mean? And I actually had a couple of people point some stuff out to me that I was doing that was self sabotaging, which was very helpful. So I kind of I don't know. I just try to use other people as an example because I didn't have a good example, you know. And so instead of sitting here thinking, oh, my behaviors are perfect, which is what my family thinks, like my dysfunctional family thinks that their behaviors are great. Like my dad, you know, my dad thinks there was nothing wrong with what he did to his wife, my mother. You know, he doesn't think there was anything wrong with the way he treated her. He thinks he, he did the right thing, you know what I mean? And and he, think, and he thinks that he did fine by, by his sons, you know. That he, doesn't, he doesn't realize that his behavior was completely, you know, completely destructive on the whole family. And that's because he's mentally ill and he refused to get help, right? And so, you know, and he refuses to even acknowledge that he's mentally ill, which is a real problem because he was diagnosed. He was diagnosed schizophrenic years ago. And he refuses to even acknowledge that and realize that he is a sick man and he really needed to get help many years ago. And as the as the family was growing along, you know, growing, moving through this life, you know, in this destructive crazy, abusive lifestyle, um, you know, there, he was encouraged to get help, you know, even even though he was abusing us, he was abusing his mother, my mother was abusing all of us, some of the older siblings were were talking to my parents after they had moved out of the house, and they were saying, you guys, you know, you should get some help, right, because you need help, and they knew that, they were diagnosed, right, but see, they, my dad likes to live in his own little world, and he thinks he's perfect, and he thinks everything's great, and can't figure out why, so, why his children have this this all this stuff against him, you know, he's just like, Well, I'm the best. I'm I'm like you know, he's I mean, he used to come in the house and tell us he was God. <laughs> you know. And he would well actually he would come in and he'd say he's one of the saints. He'd be like, I'm a saint you know. I'm like one of the angels, I'm a saint, you know, and he'd come in with his white suit and, and you know, uh, trash the family, right? So I mean the man is ill, mentally ill. And so, you know, I mean he had he had every opportunity to get help. It's not like his family didn't want him to get help. I mean, things would have gone so much better had he gotten help. And it's like my mother, same thing with her. She was manic depressive. And things would have been so much better had she gotten some help, right? But the two of them refused to get help because they wanted, 
they really thought their behavior was just great. It was perfect, you know, wake up in the morning and trash each other, trash the family, you know, go to bed at night and trash each other and trash the family. That was just wonderful to them. But to the, to the children, you know, it wasn't very fun for us, you know what I mean? And it wasn't fun to watch. It wasn't fun to be a part of. It wasn't fun to be having to deal with that, you know what I mean? And And the psychosis and the craziness that was going on. My dad was always talking about the devil, the devil, that we were the devil, that the mother was the devil, um, that the devil was coming, he was always the devil, and he still does that today, right? And I think he's very annoyed, he's schizophrenic, right? And, um, you know, it was kind of, it's just a bad way to grow up, you know? And then mother, with her, with her suicidal rants and craziness and rages and, you know, and then the next day she's making you cookies and, you know, giving you a $20 bill, it's like, okay... <laughs> You know, just absolutely insane, and and to have to grow up under that because two people would not get any help. You know, that's just that's really what prompted me to not allow myself to be like my parents, right? And as you know, through my whole life, I've actually really tried very hard not to, not to not to copy them and not to emulate them. You know, like to to do the opposite of them, right? So whatever they did, I kind of felt like, well, I need to try to do the opposite of that because they are absolutely crazy. So what I did is I started to develop a whole lot of love within myself. You know. And even though I didn't have a lot of love for myself, I had a lot of love for other people. And I kind of learned now after, you know, especially after I started my healing journey at the age of 41, I started to think, I, I do love myself, you know what I mean? Like, I really do. And I need to, you know, even though I, some some days it's a little harder to believe that than others. But I really, you know, I've come to the realization that I really do. And, you know, and that I do love other people. And I do love this life. And because my parents had me on a hate, you know, hate roller coaster ride, man. I was... I was hate, hating life. I hated them for so many years, and I hated, I hated, uh, you know, what had happened to our family. I still actually do, and um, you know, but I hated, I hated this whole thing. So I couldn't find any peace or love in my heart, you know, until I finally realized that hey, I don't want to emulate them. I want to do the exact opposite. So I've got to start to learn to love. I got to start to learn to care about myself, to care about other people, and to care about this life, and um, just by doing the opposite of what my parents did, and that's really what. What what kind of the path I've been on my whole life, which goes completely against my family, because my family doesn't think there's anything wrong with my dad raping my mother, or my mom beating on me, or mistreating us. You know what I mean? Like like they just they're so warped in thinking. Even when I tell them, because like, they know what I do, you know that I'm a Canada Regional Director for Dream Catchers for Abused Children, and they know what I do, and they hate it. They absolutely hate it. They think it's they think the child abuse is okay. If you want to beat your children, you want to rape your children, that's fine. And they tell me that to my face. And you know how much that stings. It's like being it's like a slap in the face to me. Because how can anybody in your in their right mind think that there's something that, that that's okay? That somebody can do these things to a child. You know what I mean? That somebody that and, and that's okay. My brother beat his son with a hammer, so there you go. Um, he's a sick man, and you know he, he's he's uh, well, 16 years older than me, so he's heading out here pretty soon, off to the next world, and he's going to have to stand in judgment. But you know he's he you know where did he learn that from? My parents, who were beating us with everything they could get their hands on. <laughs> you know, so he's just passed it right on, and you know it's, his attitude is just sick and twisted. And he's he's and he you know and he didn't condone the, the whole fact that my that my dad was raping my mother because he said he would kill my dad. But the thing is, is here he goes and treats his own son like garbage, you know, and then and then and then hates what I'm doing. He hates the fact that I'm healing, that I'm on my healing journey, that I've that I'm working with dream catchers for abused children to stop child abuse, and he hates that because he thinks that life should be about hate. That's his whole thing is because he hates love, he hates anything to do with love. That's how warped our family is. That's why I can't hang around with him. You know what I mean? Um, you know I can't be around that stuff. Because he's got, he just hates. He's just that. He just hates everything. And that, where did he get that from? The same parents I got it from. You know what I mean? So for people, people might have a hard time thinking, well, what? How? How could this happen? And you know what I mean? Like how? How bad could it really be? It could be really bad. You know what I mean? Uh, to to have people hate, hate, hate. And that's my parents. My parents hated each other. And they would scream and curse at each other. You know, like every day, I hate you. You son of a, you know, and cursing and swearing and throwing things at each other and turn violent, start slapping each other around and beating on each other with things. My mom was usually just trying to protect herself, but my dad would be the instigator. And then my mom would get upset and she would start throwing things and then that gave him a good excuse to start slapping her around. And the thing is, is my mother then, you know, when he wasn't looking, 
on a on a normal day when he'd be reading the paper on the couch would get him you know she'd be like waiting for her opportunities and she would wait until he wasn't looking and then she'd catch him in the head with a frying pan or whatever she could get you know and then the fight would be on again and like it was absolutely ridiculous that they two people could hate each other so much and decide to stay together in this one little house wherever we lived it didn't matter which little house it was and that we that that and try to keep this family <laughs> you know it's like absolutely insane so you know this is where i came from this complete hatred and evil and that's why i wrote my book a life of death the redemption because it really was a life of death you know like i mean i wanted to die i was like i, w- I would have been happy had my mother killed me you know by the time i was 10 years old i was like go ahead and kill me please do put me out of my misery i'm sick i'm tired i am i'm 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 dead <laughs> you know and that's a hard place to come back from you know what i mean like and i so that's why i know what it's like for people out here and i know how hard it is for people and you know that's why i'm doing these shows in particular because i'm hoping to reach that person who thinks there's no hope out there you know who who feels that there's no hope because they've been shown that there's no hope and i just really want to to tell people that that's a lie that's false and that's a lie and that there that's totally not reality there is there is good days, there is good stuff, you know what I mean? And there's always going to be bad stuff. That's normal. you got to be a realist, you know? Things happen, you know? I mean, it's not going to be perfect days every day. And it, there's not going to be good days every day. Some days are just harder than others, you know? And sometimes things come up and that you cannot you cannot control, you know? Illness and sickness and, and job loss and everything else, which I'm experiencing all the, all the, all the time and at the same time, you know what I mean? <laughs> but the thing is, that, that that's, not, that's not the be-all and end-all of my life. You know what I mean? It's my personal um, feeling. It's my personal, um, you know, love for myself and my spirit, my soul that's within me that really matters. You know what I mean? And the fact that I can give love. I, I can show love just as well as I can receive love. And I can enjoy this life no matter what situation I'm going through because it's not this life is all about collecting goodies and, you know, who makes the most money and who has the best health and all this garbage. It's like, you know, I found peace, you know, I found peace. And that's why I, I you know, I really know where people are at when they're, when they're suffering. And, and because I've been there, I've been in hell and I'm, you know, uh, or a hell-like place and a hell-like state of my life. And for all my life. I've tilled up the place. Wow, I don't have to stay there. I can, I can climb out. I'm allowed to climb out, you know. Praise God. You know, and this is just it. You know, my mother was used as a child and then married this man. My dad horrible monster really I mean his mental child and it happened, you know what I mean? It's very strange. But anyway, um and they're all real, so it's kind of weird. But anyway, the, he, he marries this man who, you know, who who could have loved her, who could have treated her right, and, and helped to get better. Instead of that, he just abused her. She was abused, and they just had to put this man in the marriage. We kept telling her to leave. My family would tell her to leave, all the older siblings, you know, and then the courts actually told her to leave. And, uh, you know, I mean, everybody was telling her to leave. The neighbors were telling her to leave. Her friends, she had a couple of friends, neighbor friends, who would tell her to get out, you know, and she was cha- she was trapped in her mind. She was totally changed. She believed that even through all this garbage that she loved her husband. Because she didn't really hate him. They had a hate for each other. I, I would never say stuff to hate him. Him, I hate him. Some of my brothers, I'd be like, I hate him. I hate him. And I'd tell him to his face. I didn't care. I was like, go ahead, kill me. I don't care. What are you gonna do? Knock my head off? Good. Go for it. And you know, this is how I was growing up because I was sick and tired of garbage. And um, you know, so I, I'd curse and 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 really, really cursing him. I hate him. I'd be like, and, and she didn't want her children to hate him, even though you know, they hate each other. Hate for the next day, my mother. I hate you, you son of a bitch, you're going to hell, and blah, 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 you know. So, see, it was very twisted, very sick and twisted, and, you know, this is just it. You know, we, we can't, you know, we can't take that, that, I mean, we can't keep that stuff. And that's what I realized four years ago, is that I had to let all of that stuff go. That was, that was really part of this 
be in size. I want to be in that people are ready. And, uh, yeah, who knows? But also, yeah, sorry about the sound. You never know um, with Blog Talk Radio how the connection is going to go. So that's unfortunate. But I know a lot of my shows are like that, and it's kind of it's really sad. But anyway, down towards the bottom, he says, learning is remembered. So he says, teaching is reminders that you can remember to no one else can do what is. He says, nothing outside of you can bring the truth to one. You can only be able to bring the truth first within. And he says, this age of healing and joy is a time of each individual to access the truth within. And it is not a time for gurus or cults or channeled entities or anyone else to tell you who you are. And he says, outside agencies, other people, channeled entities, this book can only remind you of what you already know on some level. It is that your own truth, remembering, and it's in your path, finding your bliss. So joy really start. The section is um, grief, love, and fear of intimacy, and that's what we'll go to um, starting tomorrow. So we'll take a look at this tomorrow, grief, love, and fear of intimacy. And, um, yeah, the grieving work, you know, like, I mean, I, I've allowed myself to work through quite a bit of it, and I'm sure I still have some to do. But um, it's just, you know, yeah, it's important to not do it on your own if you think that you can. If you feel like, well, I you know, I can't handle it or I don't know, you know, I don't know if I could do that work. If you're not 100% sure, you know, that you can do that work on your own, then I wouldn't do it. I was absolutely 100% sure that I would not hurt myself or that I would not hurt somebody else and that I would be fine doing this work on my own. You know what I mean? But I knew that. I was cognitive enough to say, okay, I'm 100% certain that I can do this work on my own. Um, because back, you know, a few years ago, back when I was in my 30s and I was doing my grieving process, I wasn't really safe to doing it on my own, but I was stuck to my own when I realized I could do work now. And so I think you think you're going to just bring your friend to you but I get you don't have to do particular I have a friend that you can not have they're not home. No, and I think it's just important to know that you can you can phone a crisis line, you can phone somebody. You know what I mean? Make sure that you do not allow yourself to to destroy yourself or to to you know hurt yourself because you you don't want to make a phone call. So that's what really bothers me about my brothers is that you know they just felt that there was no hope and that they just gave up and they just killed themselves. You know? Not together, like many years apart, but it's absolutely ridiculous that two of my brothers killed themselves. You know what I mean? And and Get the help that they needed. You know what I mean? They didn't you know they had people trying out that couldn't. It's important. That's why I keep saying on, on these on my shows to make sure that you, you know, you call a crisis line or you do whatever you do, but you make sure to reach out to somebody because it's very, you know, if you're 100% sure you can do this work on your own, then I wouldn't do that. Even the adult survivors of, of uh, child abuse, the, uh, the ASCA support org, website. It's about 120 pages just long. And they do work for you. They have 50 pages on 51st. So that's how serious this stuff is. Like, there's 35 pages on um, safety first in, before you even do the workbook, right? So, I mean, that's how important it is. And, and that's a great work. I've actually gone through that. And it's really good stuff. So, um, from support S-U-P-P-R-T, dot org. And it's a uh, program. It's the uh, it's really really good stuff. So thanks everybody for being here. Don't forget to check out Stop Abuse Now. Scan that's Bill Murray here on Blog Talk Radio. www.blogtalkradio.com forward slash Bill B I L L hyphen Murray M U R R A Y. Bill Murray, he's got a great show on there. Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, the National Association for Adult Survivors of Child Abuse, and, and he's got a show here. He does it every Monday through Friday and on Sundays. He's got a psychologist on there, and he's got an, uh, other people on there, and he's got survivors on there, and he he's a, he's a survivor himself, and it's a great show. Be sure and check it out. Have a great day, everybody, and we'll talk to you real soon. Bye bye. <laughs>